Hello and welcome to Worship with Covenant Presbyterian DTC. I'm Pastor Barb. I think of you guys all the time and I miss you dearly. I hope you are continuing to stay safe and well and aren't going too nuts during this time of continued safer at home. You may have noticed my attire today. Mm -hmm. I know, I'm dressed for the opera because it's the Bible on Broadway. And today's show is The Phantom of the Opera. But first, let's turn our attention to God who loves us and to worshiping God together. So let's open our time with this call. God of hope, we come into your presence this morning with confidence that you will meet us here. Where there is sadness, bring joy. Where there is tiredness, bring refreshment. Where there is despair, bring a renewed sense of hope. Let this gathering, this strange cyber gathering, be a sanctuary, a safe haven for us, a home for holy words and songs and prayers as we devote ourselves to you, God, in worship. And welcome to our Grow Curriculum series called Not Normal. And we've been taking looks at ways in which Jesus was not normal. Last week, we learned that Jesus was the Son of God. And with that title comes some not normal responsibilities and actions. So for instance, Jesus took over some not normal friends. Jesus made friends with people that weren't your typical people to make friends with. Uh, people that actually a lot of people didn't like. It was like two opposites meeting. Kind of like Spongebob and Plankton in this clip here. F is for friends who do stuff together. U is for you and me. N is for anywhere and anytime at all. Down here in the deep blue sea. F is for fire that burns down the whole town. Use for uranium bombs. N is for no survivors when you... Plankton, those things aren't what fun is all about. Now, do it like this. F is for friends who do stuff. Never. That's completely idiotic. Here, let me help you. F is for friends who do stuff together. U is for you and me. Try it! N is for anywhere and anytime and all. Down here in the deep blue sea. Wait, I don't understand this. I feel all tingly inside. 
Should we stop? No, that's how you're supposed to feel. Well, I like it. Let's do it again! Okay! F is for frolic through all the flowers. U is for ukulele. N is for nose picking, sharing common sun licking here with my best buddy. <laughs> you see, Jesus didn't care if you were a Plankton or a Patrick or a Sandy or a Mr. Krabs. Jesus started spreading love and the message of God's kingdom and just uh, hope and healing to whoever he came into contact with. And let's take, let's see some examples. So in Matthew 8, Jesus started touching and hanging out with sick people. You see, back in the day, there was a highly contagious and very dangerous disease called leprosy. Um, so much so that people with leprosy had to live outside of the city that they would have lived in. And if they ever did come in contact with people or needed to go into the city, they carried a bell and they'd ring it. They'd ring the bell and they'd say, not clean, unclean, unclean, S telling everyone to stay away from them. Imagine how lonely that life is. Imagine how many friends you never made because of your sickness. But Jesus, knowing he was the son of God, went around healing people who had leprosy. Um, just a huge miracle. In Luke 14, Jesus went and ate lunch with Pharisees. And even Jesus didn't like Pharisees. Pharisees were kind of like lawyers. They knew the law of the time very well, but didn't often keep it themselves. So much so that Jesus told the people that they needed to do as the Pharisees say and not as the Pharisees do. Ouch. But Jesus still got lunch with them. In Luke 7, Jesus heals the servant of a Roman soldier. You see, the Romans were the oppressive rulers at the time. They were the reason Jesus ended up dying on the cross, and Jesus still showed them kindness and love. In Mark 2, Jesus ate with tax collectors. You see, tax collectors were people who took others' hard-earned money for the government, um, and sometimes taking a little extra for themselves. Um, and Jesus interacted and loved on all of these people. And you know, in all of those moments, Jesus is actually leading by example. He's showing his disciples how God wants us to act. And it's a great example for us today. You see, we may not meet people who are normal. And the more we start meeting people who aren't normal or aren't normal to be friends with, people might start looking at us like we're not normal. But as we're learning that through the action of Jesus, that we might start be learning that it's okay to not be normal. And it might actually be a really good thing. Peace and blessings, church. Based on the 1910 horror novel by Gaston Leroux, the Phantom of the Opera, the musical by Andrew Lloyd Webber, is a thrilling and romantic account of the legendary Phantom, a musical genius who dwells deep below the majestic opera house in Paris. Shunned by society for his horrible facial deformity, the Phantom takes a promising young soprano, Christine, under his wing and grooms her for operatic fame all the while falling deeply in love with her. As Christine grows ever more successful, the handsome young man from her past begins to successfully court her. The phantom descends into a jealous rage and terrorizes the opera company with increasingly dangerous threats. It's a story about love, rage, jealousy, loneliness, and rejection. Our scripture for today is about the exact same things. It's from the life of King Saul, who, as his life went on, sunk into paranoia, jealousy, and vindictive rage. Our scripture is from the book of Samuel, and it's a slice of the life of Saul that shows this jealousy setting in, and it's about the young man David, David has killed Goliath 
and become a very successful warrior in Saul's army. He's also very close to the king and is known to hang out in the throne room playing his lyre and singing to calm the king's nerves. So here's what happens. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, Goliath, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines and songs of joy and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. Saul was very angry. This saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. The next day, a harmful spirit rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand and he hurled the spear where he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. Sorry, I gotta get my next page here. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. So Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people and David had success in all his undertakings for the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in fearful awe of him but all Israel and Judah loved David, for he went out and came in before them. King Saul let his jealousy of David take over his life. David wound up having to flee the palace and the service of the king literally to save his life. The king was out to murder him. The spear incident was only the, the first one. David lived in hiding for years, amassing his own army for the day that he would be king. And so in our musical for today, the Phantom lets his jealousy over Christine take over his life and his actions. The story opens <clears throat> with the great soprano Carlotta Guidicelli rehearsing for the opera's debut that evening. As she sings her aria, a backdrop crashes down right next to her. The superstitious members of the chorus insist that this is the work of the Phantom. And a frightened Carlotta refuses to perform that evening. Meg, who performs in the opera's ballet, suggests that her fellow dancer, Christine, should take over. And as Christine wows the managers with her audition, the scene changes to the opera that evening, the performance where Christine is enjoying consummate success. The opera's most distinguished patron, Raoul, the Count de Chenier, recognizes Christine as his childhood acquaintance. And as they reconnect after the show, they sing together, Think of Me.
Can it be? Can it be Christine? Bravo! Long ago, it seems so long ago, how young and innocent we were. She may not remember me, but I remember. Fly away, but when you lie awake, remember how we used to be. And please promise me that sometimes you will Backstage, after her triumphant debut, Christine confesses to her friend Meg that her singing has been inspired by an unseen tutor that she knows only as the Angel of Music. She has never seen him, but she associates his disembodied voice with her dying pro father's promise to send her an Angel of Music to watch over her even though Christine has never seen the phantom, only heard his voice guiding her, she has great affection for his help and tutelage. Christine's childhood friend, Raoul de Chenier, that she has just reconnected with, asks her to dinner that night. And as he leaves to get his hat, the phantom, jealous of Raoul's familiarity with his protege, commands Christine to look in the mirror in her dressing room. She sees the phantom in the mirror for the first time and is irresistibly drawn to him she takes his hand and disappears through the mirror with him. The phantom leads Christine deep into the caverns and waterways beneath the opera house and across a subterranean lake lit by candelabras. When they reach his secret lair, he plays a huge organ and sings of his shadowy, sensual world of music, the music of the night. 
Heightens each sensation, darkness stirs and wakes imagination. Silently the senses abandon their defenses. its splendor, grasp it, sense it, tremulous and tender, turn your face away from the garish light of day, turn your thoughts away from cold and feeling light, and listen to the music of the night. morning, Christine wakes up to the sound of the phantom composing at the organ. She steals away his mask and reveals his horribly disfigured face. 
Although he is enraged, he's reluctant to return her to the theater and only does so after realizing that her absence will cause a search. The Phantom then begins a full assault on the opera. He wants Christine to star in the next opera. The managers and the cast all get threatening notes from the Phantom, including Raoul, who is forbidden ever to see Christine again. And another, dec another note decreed that Christine should be given the leading role in the next opera. The lead soprano, Carlotta, is furious. And of course, everyone reassures her that the part is still hers. When the opera debuts, with Charlotte in the lead and not Christine, all hell breaks loose. No one has heeded the notes from the Phantom and now they are going to pay. The Phantom's mystical powers make Carlotta croak like a toad. Christine is announced as the replacement, but in the mayhem, the murdered corpse of the lead stagehand drops from the rafters hanging from a lasso. In the, ensu in the ensuing chaos, Christine escapes with Raoul to the roof and tells him about her encounter with the phantom in the caves. Raoul promises to love and protect her. Christine reciprocates his vow as they sing together, unaware that the jealous phantom has overheard their entire conversation. Forget these wide-eyed fears I'm here, nothing can harm you My words will warm and calm you Let me be your freedom Let daylight dry your tears I'm here, with you beside you To guard you and to guide you
It has now been six months since the craziness and the murder at the Opera House. Raoul and Christine have become secretly engaged. The Phantom reappears at the Opera House to further terrorize them. He ultimately kidnaps Raoul and Christine and takes them down to his lair below the Opera House. The Phantom's end game is to offer Christine a choice to succumb to him or to see her Raoul die. Christine, feeling both terror and pity, approaches the phantom and kisses him. The kiss has a magical effect. The creature releases Raoul and urges them both to cross the lake. And as they leave, he whispers, Christine, I love you. The phantom covers himself with his cloak as the mob breaks in. And when the cloak is snatched away, only his mask remains. Drop curtain. Christine has a whole range of emotions about the phantom throughout the show, all of them colored by the reality that he has had a lonely and difficult life and assuredly an even worse childhood, being shunned and ridiculed by his deformity. Part of us wants to have pity for him as well, except when we see his jealous rage turn into threatening and harming others. We see his human spirit lost in these horrible behaviors. We see this in Saul as he pursues David for years with his armies consumed by his jealousy and rage, threatened by David's popularity and trying to preserve his hold on his kingdom. The Bible warns us about the slide into darkness. The negative slide of human emotions is very real. In both the story of the phantom and the biblical story of King Saul, neither end well. Their lives are full of mistakes and disappointment. Saul eventually just flat out disregards God and dies a lonely death in battle along with his sons. What is interesting in both stories is the response of both Christine and David to their jealous counterparts. David, on more than one occasion, while he's running for his life, he has opportunities to kill Saul, but he doesn't. On one occasion, Saul has gone into a cave to <laughs> relieve himself, and David sneaks up close enough to cut a piece off of the corner of Saul's robe to prove that he could have killed him, but he didn't. David loves Saul and does not want to bring harm to God's anointed. In a similar manner, in response to the phantom's threats to kill Raoul at the end of the show, Christine kisses him quite passionately. The kiss is like a release for the phantom. It seems that in it, he feels the love that he never received in his lifetime and he melts. He lets both Christine and Raoul go. There's a warning for us in these stories to keep our strong negative emotions in check. Feel them. We're gonna feel things, right? And feelings in and of themselves aren't wrong, but feel them, let them pass. Don't let your negative emotions of jealousy or anger or frustration dictate your behavior. As followers of Christ, more is expected of us and we have God's help to do it. There's a warning and an encouragement, the warning not to slide into negative and harmful behaviors based on negative thoughts and feelings. And the encouragement is to see each person as a child of God, even with all their faults, even with all their bad behaviors, sometimes a little understanding, a little love can go a long way in transforming another person. May God bless these stories to you today. And now friends, as Jack sings a song for us, I invite you to, 
to contemplate this month your gifts to God and to your church. And as we dedicate them with this song, we thank you for your generosity. Hi everyone, Jack here. Happy Sunday. Today's praise song is Hill Songs, Here I Am to Worship, so I hope you enjoy it, and here it goes. As we close our time today, receive this benediction. Let your lives witness to Christ's love. Let your words bring reconciliation. Let your thoughts be of peace. Let your touch be of healing. Let your actions count for justice. Be a sign of hope and a beacon of joy. Go and may God's blessing go with you. Amen.